means to drive the circular economy? Is there a role for resource taxation? To which, uh, with my kind of academic background, there's a resounding yes, but I would like to hear Dominic's arguments for that, uh, or indeed against it, if that's what he's going to argue. Dominic is, is an enormously um, accomplished person in this field. I've found out all sorts of things, although I've known him a very long time, all sorts of things I didn't know. Honours degree in physics from the University of Oxford, PhD in the economics of technical change from the University of Cambridge. Uh, he's worked across projects. He's built a very successful company called Unomia, and we'll probably tell you uh, how many dozens of people this company now employs. Uh, so he's not only uh, a first-rate scientist, uh, but also a first-rate businessman. Uh, uh, as, an, as an academic, uh, I'm terribly impressed always by first-rate business, uh, business people. Um, and most recently, he's, um, his company did the uh, impact assessment for the review of the waste legislation that was part of the European Commission's so-called circular package, um, circular economy package, um, which was withdrawn by the new commission. Uh, and they're going to come up with a more ambitious approach, and I, I don't know, perhaps where, uh, Dominic will say whether his, uh, his company is involved in uh, helping the Commission do that, because uh, they certainly need some help, uh, and they clue what they're going to do with the package at the moment. But that's enough from me. Uh, you'll have gathered, uh, from what I said, I hope that we're in for a real treat. Dominic, enormous pleasure to have you with us. <laughs> Many thanks for, for the kind uh, words of welcome. And um, so, oops, this is going to be this. That was an internet. Let's get to the start. It's always a well, I'm, I'm glad it happens to a PhD in the economics of technical technological change. Absolutely. It always happens to me. Yeah, but you know, in no way, the people who got PhDs have made it too. So, uh, oops, sorry, um, this is the wrong one, that's why I've gone to the wrong one, apologies for that. Uh, that, that looks interesting too. It is, it is, uh, <laughs> it is I hope, interesting, um, but it's slightly different to uh, this one. Subject is sort of very close to uh, my and my uh, company's heart. Um, don't know that you can really pronounce on the quality of my entrepreneurship but coming to me year end in the accounts. You know, they may not look uh, like they should. Um, but uh, yeah, the, the this is a subject which, um, as many of you in the room will know, the circular economy has risen up rapidly up the. Uh, the agenda in terms of the consciousness uh, of people working in the environmental field generally, particularly of waste and resources. Uh, it's nothing, you know, you will hear time and time again people saying it's nothing new. You know, people were talking about this in the 1970s, maybe even people will say, no, it wasn't in the 70s, it was the 1960s. Um, uh, but, you know, what's, what's I think interesting about this incarnation, if you like, of the circular economy has been the attention that has been given to it by businesses. And and I think it's also fair to say that we're starting to realize that whereas we've uh, for a long time played around in the sort of waste management sector and we have this sort of hierarchical ordering of the way we think we should deal with waste, all the waste hierarchy, <clears throat> that's tended to reflect a view where we sort of accepted the wastes that were coming at us and we didn't necessarily give sufficient attention as to how we could make sure less of it came at us in the first place by designing the products and uh, uh, the, the packaging and so forth that we consume more, more cleverly. And I think that's probably been one of the major changes. So a lot of you would have seen this diagram. It's seen, I've seen this in so many places. I don't think there is a more popular uh, uh, graphic in the, the sort of area where we're, that we're dealing with at the moment. This is from the Ellen MacArthur Foundation and it shows essentially their view of the uh, circular economy 
or a view of the circular economy. A few interesting comments about it. The, the, the separation on the one hand of these technical nutrients and on the I bought this along. I never use this, I never get to use this thing. But um, uh, and on the left hand side, these the so-called biological nutrients, and you have these um, circles uh, in, in terms of what the circular economy would like to how they would like to see these um, materials being managed in the economy as a whole. And the concept of the circular economy is that there is a so-called power of the inner circle, so you want to try and keep the circles as tight as possible to maintain not just the materials in use, but if you're thinking about some of the more complex products that people are making these days, um, we're, we're quite used now. It took a long time to get uh, people, for example, in the Department of Energy and Climate Change, or as it used to be, people used to be responsible for energy, used to be the DTI, and then BIS. Um, it took a long, long time to get those people to understand that materials were embodied energy. And I, I advised a House of Commons uh, select committee back in the year um, 2000, and it was around the review of the waste strategy. And I pointed out that actually if um, what was then DTI did what they wanted to do with waste, and they wanted to use it to generate energy, then we couldn't have met the targets that we were obliged to meet under the packaging directive in terms of recycling materials. And there was this sort of mismatch. It didn't get this point that materials embodied energy. Now as a physicist, <laughs> that's the, the Einsteinian equation at the sort of subatomic level is uh, um, something you can, you know, you, you, you get used to. And uh, uh, it is quite interesting now to be grappling with that uh, same equation, if you like, the materials are energy um, at the, uh, the macro level. But the thing is here as well, what we're trying to do in these inner circles is we're trying to we're trying to maintain the value embodied in, as it were, the labor that we use to make things. And so we're trying to maintain value in parts and in products rather than just in materials where arguably we're only in, in the recycling loop, we're maintaining the energy, uh, the embodied energy in the materials, but maybe not the same level of embodied value in terms of value added through uh, labor, workmanship, and so forth. Biological nutrients are slightly different, and you can see it's quite interesting. This is like nebulous cascades. So what's going on there? Um, and um, but the, the point here is that the best thing we can do on the, on this side, certainly in terms of things like food waste, is to be trying to prevent it in the first place. Again, we know that the manufacture of food embodies a lot of uh, energy and, um, and and carbon dioxide, and so. Uh, we're trying to prevent that in the first instance, but then we want to try and keep it separate because what we're talking about over here is keeping these nutrients in the cycle, and you can see that they're sort of the concept is they're getting returned to land where they're not being converted into some sort of biochemical feedstock. Um, some of you would have seen that the um, that Biz released uh, recently their new sort of document on the strategy for the bioeconomy, which is very much dealing with this side of the. Uh, the circular economy uh, graphic, and it's basically looking at what can we do in the future to uh, create um, biochemical feedstocks, quite interesting chemicals from uh, waste biomass. Um, and you've already got some interesting examples of this happening. Uh, there's the Borregard facility in Norway that's adjacent to a pulp mill that takes in lignin rich materials and converts them into interesting chemicals vanillin and so forth that, uh, that are being, uh, that, are, that have high value. And this is often juxtaposed with the so-called linear economy, which is the, okay, we take stuff out of the ground, we make things and then we throw them away. I'm a bit, sort of, so, somebody's worked hard over the last 15 years to try and improve, and Jacob here from the Environmental Services Association, try to improve the way we manage waste. I, I always get a little touchy about how uncircular we really are. This is a really good example of the use of an economic instrument um, in that it shows the amount of waste going into landfills in the UK over time um, and the top colour, the yellow is the, the material going at the lower rate of tax which is tends to be the sort of uh, inert, non-gassing stuff that doesn't create methane into the landfills. So 
rubble, soil and so forth from construction and demolition typically or only power station ash in some cases. And then you've got the, uh, the stuff going at a standard rate. And you can see in both cases, we've seen this massive drop in the amount of stuff we're actually sending to landfills. It's a very impressive uh, graphic in terms of what's happened. And we can look at that in another way. Um, this is showing that material going in at the standard rate. And if we subtract, we know that there have been all sorts of policy instruments used to attack the stuff that you and I give to our local authorities or their contractors to deal with. There's been all sorts of policy instruments to deal with that. There haven't been as much, there hasn't been as much by way of policy to deal with this stuff other than this tax, which is, you can no, notice how it's relatively flat in terms of how much was being sent to landfill, and then it dro starts to drop off um, reasonably steeply as the tax starts to escalate up to current levels of 80 quid a tonne. So, um, it's a, it's, we're not as, we're not as linear as we think we are. This is local authority collected waste. This is the recycling bit, recycling and composting. We're doing better than we were. And if we were to, I'm just going to go back up one slide, and you can see that this material, this non-local authority waste, we've got 10 million tonnes going into uh, landfills roughly now, less than 10 million tonnes. We think we've got abysmal data on commercial and industrial waste. It's a dreadful situation. If we're ever going to have anything remotely like a circular economy, we've got to address the data side. Commercial industrial waste in total is about uh, 45 million tonnes. So where's the rest of it going? And actually, we don't really know. That's the scandal of the thing. And um, we think we've probably got a recycling rate of that of, of somewhere above 50%. We don't really know. But everything here tells us that since we've only got about 8, 9 million tonnes going to landfill, we know there's only about 2 million tonnes going into incineration. Something interesting is going on with the rest. Now, some of that's a bit too interesting for the likes of Jacob and his uh, crew, because like it or not, as we're talking about trying to go forward to a circular economy, we've actually got a growing um, problem with uh, waste crime dealing with some of these uh, uh, materials. And here's the construction and demolition waste. Construction, demolition, and excavation waste. Here's the construction and demolition waste. The top color is the recycling. And so if you add them both together, and we're talking a very large waste stream here, we're above the 50% level in the recycling, and secondly aggregates. We've got some material going to what are called exempt sites. So this stuff is being used for bunding, landscaping, and so forth. And then we've got material here that's going to landfill, and then this stuff here is going to waste transfer stations and some of that was, is probably going to get recycled once it goes to those transfer stations. So in terms of beneficial use, we're, we're up to 65% in those two and then we've probably got a bit of this one, so probably around 70%. So we're not as uncircular as we think. Now, a lot of the work around the circular economy and the, um, those who are now picking it up and, and running with it, um, have made the case for doing so um, to, to a considerable degree, not exclusively, but to a considerable degree on the argument that what's happened is we've seen this uh, real, the, the real, a, a drop in um, uh, commodity prices over time until the beginning of the 2000s, and then this sort of hockey stick diagram uh, where we've got this reversal of that over the last 10 years. And the argument that's being played is, well, okay, you've got more volatile commodity prices, you've got higher commodity prices, these days are over, forget them, let's, so as to defray the risk to your business of higher commodity prices and so forth, you ought to start thinking about making better use of those materials, not letting them slip away from you. You want to keep them uh, for yourself, as it were, and retain them in your uh, uh, remanufacturing, either to sell as goods as new, remanufacturing them, or to uh, take apart particular products and, and use parts and reuse those parts. You might be using those in the remanufacturing process and so forth. 
Now, I, I've always found this graphic really difficult to take seriously. Uh, one of the things I did do um, in between my degrees was I, I actually spent a bit of time forecasting policy prices for the Bank of England's World Economic Prospects model. And um, uh, I was as wrong as the next day. That's all I can say. And um, it's not an easy thing to do. And the argument, I think there's something disingenuous in this graphic, to be portraying to businesses that you should somehow extrapolate from that logic <clears throat> that for the next 20 years, or whatever it is, you should, you should establish your business model around this so-called fact. I think it, it's, it's, it troubles me because I don't think I know where commodity prices are going from one day to the next, and I think many other people would say the same thing who are dealing in those markets. And, and, and I, I, it troubles me for more than one reason. I think I could draw this graphic in all sorts of different ways, depending on where I started to look at it. I think they could draw the lines all over the place. <laughs> Depends on the scale I'm looking at and where I'm looking at. Maybe I block off those years and it doesn't look as though everything's going down. If, any, if anything, it looks sort of pretty flat. And if I you know, block off those years, then it might even look as though the general trend is up anyway. And so I think you know, th this sort of analysis slightly concerns me. And, and that's one of the reasons why you know, I think we've had some bodies, including our own DEFRA. I mean, uh, DEFRA, some would say, would we use any reason to have to develop policy at the moment in this area, but they, to some extent, use this as a, as a reason not to do much, because they say, well, it's going to happen anyway, isn't it, because the resources are going to get scarce, etc., etc. And I think this is, this, I'm not, I'm not convinced that this is sound. I'm not at all convinced it's sound. It's not that I know that prices are going to go down, it's that I don't think anyone knows what's going to go on there. Um, and I really don't think we have good enough information around that to, to understand. And it's quite difficult to, you know, to, this is the identity that we're being asked to, uh, to, to accept. That there's rising demand and increasing volatility, high prices in a circular economy. I don't think it's that straightforward, and I don't think we should imagine it will be. And I think if we do imagine it's that straightforward, then we probably won't do anything. And you know, commodities, you know, we know that many commodities, probably most of them, are characterized by a pretty uh, inelastic supply in the short term. And so the one thing guaranteed to make commodity prices fall is everyone thinking they're going to go up. It's almost the logical outcome of that perspective. And that's not the reason why it is happening, because it is happening. But you know, this is another depiction of real commodity prices. It's actually quite difficult to recreate the figure that we've all been looking at and saying, ooh, it's a good company. This is a respectable professor from Columbia University in a presentation to the IMF, looking at what's happened to real non-oil commodity prices since um, 1880, you know, the middle of the 19th century, second half of the 19th century. And you can see that it looks as though the world used to be a much more expensive place. Much more expensive in real terms. So, you know, should we really accept this? It's quite, you know, this is, um, this is the latest data from the World Bank in terms of various industries here, energy, non-energy, agriculture, precious metals. And, you know, we, we're um, we're seeing, since the end of, if you like, the McKinsey graphic, which is there, 2011, everything's dropping. That doesn't mean we stop and we think that none of this is serious and should ignore the potential, if you like, of the circular economy. But what I think it does is it says, actually, we have to do something to make it happen. We can't rely on the commodity markets just to... to you keep prices high and, and maintain the pressure for businesses to, uh, to do things that um, are in their interest in terms of uh, high prices. 
And it's bizarre, isn't it? You know, one of the things that strikes me is that a lot of the literature is talking very specifically and very earnestly about volatility. I sometimes think they've misinterpreted that or they've got a particular interpretation of it. Um, and then say, well, we're going to stay high. Well, what we, depends what they mean by volatility in, in that context. And some of the volatility indices that people are using are not the sort of day-to-day -day movements in commodity prices. They're standard, move, movements from the standard deviation um, over a, uh, over a five-year period. And that's not day-to-day -day type volatility. It tends to mean that you track the broad changes in price movement rather than something that you might be more interested in on a day-to-day -day basis in terms of what's happening to commodity prices. So there's a question of volatility about what it is you're talking about. But, you know, just to put this into sharper focus, this is the IMF's latest indices. Again, that's where we were ending with our McKinsey graphic, and now we're down here. And that doesn't mean, I'm saying, that commodity prices are going to go down. It doesn't mean, um, I think, one thing or another, that what, all I'm saying is we don't know. And as a consequence, I think, uh, basing the argument for a circular economy on our supposition that commodity prices will always remain high means that when they aren't high, what does that say about the logic of our argument? I think it undermines it somewhat, and it means that if we are serious about uh, wanting to bring about a circular economy, we're going to have to do something. So do we need policy to drive us circular? Uh, I hope I've managed to convince you that I think we do. I think if markets are volatile, can they really drive the behavior we want to see? And actually, it's questionable whether making that economy more circular would actually reduce the volatility anyway. Um, it might even increase it, because it might mean that people are less certain about whether the price is going to go up or down. And what that does is it brings in the traders and the bankers who are investing in these areas. Interestingly, at the moment, there are some commodity markets where volatility is actually quite low believe it or not, or has been in recent months, and the traders have moved away from it because there's nothing for them to speculate on. <laughs> there is now. So um, it's, it's an interesting area. So I think policy interventions are going to help, and by the way, it's justified. And that's the key point. We've got better reasons, I think, for looking to uh, push forward on the circular economy. Of course, there will be some uh, examples where this makes sense from a commercial point of view but it's less likely to make sense from a commercial point of view if prices are uh, lower than, than where they're higher. So, just to build a, this is some of the technical stuff that is based on some figures from zero waste stock. But it's just, this is, so what, what are, you know, if we were saying, well, what are some of the rationales? This is showing you, should we say, in old pre circular economy type language the benefits in terms of climate change savings from prevention and from recycling. So, if I'm going to go here, I'm looking at textiles maybe, this is partly based on the reuse as well. So if I'm preventing um, the use of textiles, I might be saving more than 20 tonnes of CO2 per tonne of material that I'm using. And so if I am remanufacturing, reusing and so forth, I'm effectively doing something akin to prevention of the, of the waste. And so, um, you can see that some of these numbers are quite large. We're getting 10 tonnes uh, um, for aluminium. We're getting non-ferrous metals. They're very energy intensive to produce. So we're, we're actually saving a lot of CO2 when we're um, dealing with those materials. Food is, I suppose, a really interesting one. We get a lot of saving from prevention. We don't get so much back when we treat the material through recycling it and anaerobically digesting it. Not on that graphic. So, it's, um, it's quite interesting. And by the way, you saw with the Ellen MacArthur, you might have seen the Ellen MacArthur graphic at the bottom, it said leakage. Leakage includes disposal and incineration, it's the residual waste treatments. And there's a good reason for that, is that if we put the residual waste treatments on the same graphic, even if we're getting energy back, we're not getting anything like the same benefit in terms of climate change terms that we get when we're uh, dealing with, with either preventing or recycling the materials. 
So there's an argument for doing this, isn't there? And uh, you know, you could say, well, hang on a minute, why don't we just do all of this in the EU emissions trading scheme and integrate it into somehow within that? Um, in, in the emissions trading scheme at the moment, you don't have landfills, you don't have uh, incinerators. You do have cement fields, you do have uh, aluminium and steel making. And so, um, so but in theory, you could try and integrate uh, materials management within something like the emissions trading scheme. And you could do that trying to link in some way to the embodied greenhouse gas content. Because not we are importing quite a lot of materials. Some of you will have heard the news this morning, and you've heard John Barrett from uh, York University talking about how, how much of our uh, emissions now are embodied in the import in the, in the goods that we're importing, and, and saying that, you know, well, sort of undermining the, the argument that the UK is a leader in terms of reducing climate change emissions. We import a lot of stuff, and uh, one of the problems there is that focus of the EU emissions trading scheme, the UNFCC, in terms of its focusing on the emissions that are produced within our borders, not, um, not the impact of what we consume. And economists will say, well, that's, all, that's actually not important. Um, because we'll have a global trading scheme. Not yet. Um, and it's, it's not looking especially close right now. You know, Paris might see a major moment at the end of the year. Um, but we also have uh, competitiveness concerns. And many of you will, will know that the, you've got this sort of some bit of a charade now around going through sectors that may be eligible for some sort of special treatment because they are vulnerable to what's called carbon leakage, which is where uh, actually um, some, of the, uh, some of the businesses may be rendered less, competitiveness because, less competitive because they're having to uh, buy allowances or um, play in the uh, trading market um, where, where when people outside the EU don't have to. Um, so we, we, we're, we're susceptible to that, and there's a lot of uh, sectors now that are included in that leakage argument. And then, you know, can we, as I said earlier, can we really wait for the global action that might mean that we didn't have to worry about leakage because the whole world had some integrated emissions trading scheme? Um, I'm not sure, but we, you know, I'm, I'm not... I'd love to think that was going to happen sooner or later. We've got more and more emissions trading schemes popping up all around the world. Um, but, you know, and in any case, are they really going to lead to the sorts of carbon prices that I suspect we might need in order to uh, really um, drive us to the uh, objectives we ought to be looking to get to? So what do we do with policy? Um, there's a lot of discussion around the circular economy about new business models um, where you're looking at servicising, as it were, products. So instead of um, building companies, selling people um, steel girders, they effectively lease um, girders to them. Or it might be lighting in the building. You don't buy lighting per se, you buy um, the service of uh, light provision effectively from, from the lighting manufacturers and they can replace your, your um, bulbs and things when, when, they, when they need replacing. So you're not buying per se and they maintain the materials in enclosure. They learn more about how their products perform and there are certain advantages to them in doing that and they maintain relationships with their customers, certain relationships, good, good things in that as well. But I think policy making driven by those business models will not always be easy to do and it might not even be desirable if it means we're sort of, as it were, skewing the market in, in some areas towards some business models and notwithstanding the fact they may be appropriate for some goods uh, but they might not be appropriate for others. And so you sort of start to think, well, if we're trying to understand what policies we might use and then what is it that the circular economy is really trying to do? Certainly trying to get us not to throw things away, but to keep things in the cycle of utility. It might be, again, this depends on the product. It might be looking for us to increase the durability of products. It might be looking 
to us to uh, enhance their design for remanufacture. Or it could be that it's looking for uh, greater reusability of products. But what incentives there will be efficient ones? So this is an, another graphic where, forget the fact for a moment this is recycling, but this is showing um, the external benefits quantified in monetary terms per tonne of material associated with, um, linked link to uh, these materials. Um, taking on first what this means basically, if I, if I recycle as opposed to getting this material from primary production, I'm saving something over 500 pounds per tonne in terms of damages. Um, the, the implication of that is that the primary you, the use of the primary material, of course, generates an externality higher than this figure, because it's not a, the, the recycling itself generates its own externalities. So we're talking about, in, in some cases, some quite significant um, uh, damages. Bearing in mind, say, the aluminium price at the moment is, on the, on the world market, will be around, what, 700 quid a ton today, 700 quid a ton, something of that order. So the externality is the same order of the price in terms of uh, how, how these might be affecting the price. And so, you know, um, ferrous metal, we're, we are about, I think we are about 85 quid at the moment on the ferrous metal uh, markets. Dense plastics, well, we might have a slightly higher price than that at the moment. But the point is that the, the external benefits from recycling as opposed to using primary are of the same order as the price in the of these materials. That's a fairly profound thought, because it means that, you know, if we go to the sort of conventional neoclassical thinking and say, right, okay, all we've got to do is price in the externalities, blah, 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 and everything will come out nice, um, we'd potentially be doubling the price of the commodities. Or at least we'd be setting <laughs> floors at a significantly higher level than they currently are. So, um, so that sets you thinking, well, why don't we do something around primary resource taxation? It's instinctive, almost, when you start to look at this. And I, I have, I spoke to Paul, one of the reasons why I'm here is I spoke to Paul a, a year or so ago, and I said, and for many, many years, um, I sort of thought, blah, you can't do primary resource taxes. You can only do it for things like aggregates. You can only do things, things that are, are not very expensive and don't get widely traded because everybody moans about the fact they are being widely traded and they moan about the competitiveness issues. How can you be taxing my use of material when the guys over there don't get taxed? And I, I was thinking about this circular economy concept and I thought, well, it's really important, isn't it? Isn't it important that we change the way we use resources and we value them more and we value the uh, the embodied, not just the embodied energy, but also the embodied value and so forth that people have put into those in terms of them. How can we do, how can we drive that forward? And so, for me, it would be great to think we could have uh, primary resource taxes. And I started to think, because I've always said for the last 10 years, and several others have, who uh, I know as well, you know, we've been of the view that we can't do this, it's too complicated. It's way too difficult. And so the rest of this presentation, I'll try and skip through it quite quickly, is, is about why I think we have to, it's not about why I think we have to, I hope I've convinced you that we do nothing, it's about some of the issues that we would have to confront in doing that. Because I think we should try. Or at least we should definitely not say it's too difficult. So this is the attempt to try and to think in terms of what we might do. Uh, in terms of primary resource taxes, or resource taxes, I should say, with a view to helping drive the circular economy. So let's have a look. So this is that view that I always had. Only things of relative low aren't widely traded. To. So aggregates. Actually, a large number of countries with aggregates taxes. Quite a few of them. You know, I've seen a lot of studies that say there's only five. We've just done a review of 26 EU member states in terms of their uh, environmental, fiscal, their, their environmental taxes, and, and these have all got them. 
But in some cases, it's not entirely clear. I think how many you'd say it's probably a royalty rather than a tax. And in Czech Republic, it, again, it looks a bit more like a royalty fee for the use of the um, land and so forth. But all these others, it looks more or less correct to say they're taxes. And then you actually go and have a look at what else people tax. <laughs> and actually, peat, amber, Portland cement, all that shit. Additional money, spar cities, and disposable cutlery, plastic bags, CFCs, land use change, EDC, pesticides, fertilizers, and the list goes on. Phosphate and food batteries, they're all cocks now, as we know. Tires, mattresses, and bedding, and water, um, packaging, um, packaging prevention. These are often all fees rather than taxes, and we can call them taxes and not only taxes. Chewing gum and water, top of course, we had the, the recent um, report on Saturday uh, from the committee looking at litter and they decided not to do that. Transmission lines, <laughs> I mean, this isn't really environmental tax, but it was interesting anyway. Um, we, water, not just charges, water, uh, often not a, often called taxes, but not even really um, the cost recovery now. So, probably best term charges rather than taxes. Uh, and um, <coughs> water use and snow guns in parts of Austria. And here's the Latvian part of the natural, nat Latvian tax system. It's doing all these things, you know. So um, uh, it's quite interesting because Pete's in there, and, and here you have the you know, park snail. It's big. Uh, <laughs> good for the snails, they've got to be hard to get on in. And um, so they are uh, some fairly widespread range of taxes. But you know, and, and it, what, what it feels to me is like people are doing piecemeal stuff all over the place. But it's, nobody's doing it all. And nobody's going really saying, right, okay, let's start to look at this in, uh, in a much more um, concerted way. So, <coughs> an EU wide resource tax. Why would it be EU right? Well, I'm going to come on to that in a minute. And of course, that's a problem. The reason why I'm talking about just before I think this, and she was laughing at me because I think it's something. Why tax? Well, you know, we've got the um, the energy tax directive. Okay, we have a complete fallout over the attempt to revise that, but we do have an energy tax directive that sets minimum rates of tax on energy carrying products. So we done, I think. And by the way, I don't think this is going to happen tomorrow. Then that's something I should say. This is my ten year or so project. Um, differentiates by material time. What does it time? Everything. Everything. It's got to, hasn't it? Because we want everything to be included in this. We want people to be thinking about everything that they're using. They will be paid by all those folks in the world. Okay. You, this, you have to pull me up on all this. Um, we know wherever we start to talk about environmental taxes that um, the industry view is often broadly reflected by <laughs> this. Um, and it's uh, sometimes marginally more sophisticated, um, but it's generally pretty unreceptive. And one of the reasons for that, I think, is that people, is that we haven't thought sufficiently broadly about EU-wide taxes. Because if we did, we would be much more positive about using all the tax adjustments. And that's the reason for calling this the EU-wide one. In the EU, it's difficult to justify taxes at the border between countries when the whole concept is that we're trying to create a single market. Even though you find <coughs> massively different excise duties for alcohol, for example, across borders, and people, you know, journey from uh, Denmark into border shops in Germany to buy huge amounts of cans of Kronenberg to take them back to Denmark, it's nuts. So we have no tax harmonisation and get that sort of thing going on all the time. But the border tax adjustment issue is interesting. What does that mean? For those of you who don't know, what it means is that it means I can, if I'm, if I'm taxed on something I'm going to export to a country that doesn't have the same tax, but we, I, I exempt the export from the tax. <coughs> on the other hand, if there's so somebody importing material, they get taxed at the same rate as, as in my country. So in a sense, you're 
dealing with the competitiveness issue. There is the, the tax becomes neutral to the people on either side of the border well, in, in terms of how those materials compete. And um, the, I spent a long time talking to uh, a lady from the WTO at the Copenhagen Environmental Taxes Conference, and uh, I tested, tested her on uh, as a lawyer um, and tested her on a number of uh, issues around this. And essentially, if your tax treats countries inside, you know, as it were, within the EU and outside the EU equally, then that's okay. It has to be equal. There has to be no sort of um, favouring the host nation, as it were, to get, gain some sort of competitive advantage. It has to be fair. It has to be, in a sense, transparent as to how this was derived. A link to that, and this is probably quite important as well, um, it probably has to be mechanisms in there to allow producers to demonstrate that they uh, have superior performance to, shall we say, so if you had a tax on, a, say, a computer, and you said, oh, typically a computer has this material, this material, this material, so we're going to tax it at this rate. There'd have to be a mechanism for that company, for the company um, exporting into the, into the EU to justify a lower rate of tax on its own products. And that would require some sort of verification. But it overcomes one of those main drawbacks of the EU ETS. You can't do a border tax adjustment in a trading scheme where the, the value of the allowances is going like this from day to day. How would you adjust the value of the, uh, even if you knew what the carbon content or whatever the CO2 content of what was coming in was, you wouldn't be able to do it. It's dynamic. So, and that in turn overcomes some of the arguments around leakage. And you, in theory, you sort of pulled the rug from underneath the um, industry in terms of silence and industry on competitive terms. Now, the information ones are massive, aren't they? Because, you know, I've got to know all the material that's in my computer or in my mobile phone. I, I, I get that. I really do. And I worry about it a lot if in my 10-year my scheme to make this work. But I actually think that the capabilities, you know, it used to be the case that people only used to set taxes on pesticides according to whether they were, the idea used to be on kilograms of active ingredient, or they did it on whether it was a herbicide, a fungicide, or an insecticide. Now they've banned it by hazard and they can use any number of bands they want because the computational power of computational power is just much, much higher than it was. And I'm sure there are similar examples of what's going on abroad us in terms of how custody authorities work. But I think there are, uh, we've got more and more uh, capabilities to do that information. And there are other drivers as well, and some of them come from the circular economy itself, which is about having better information on the products regarding their materials content, so you know how to recycle them and so forth. Product information regarding repair is another example, it's not directly linked to this sort of stuff. Product information regarding carbon footprints. And we've got a lot of interest now in, in the concept of acid tracking and so forth, and trying to find out what's going on, et cetera, et cetera. So what, these are all going to place, if we're serious about it, demands on the information that we have to have around products. Um, what I'm asking for may be particularly demanding, but it might be that some of those demands can be offset by, set, by setting, as I said earlier, sort of standard rates for products, materials that people can, that have the opportunity to effectively argue deviations from. This is not a short-term enterprise, I know that. And then there's this other thing that worries me as well, which is about the differentiation between the primary and secondary material. I showed you the graphic earlier about the, diff the, the differential externalities between recycled material and primary material. And they're big, they're really big. And so what we would want to be encouraging people who were using materials to be favoring the secondary rather than the primary. And so if we were able to differentiate in that way, then presumably that would give a price advantage to the secondary, other things be equal. And we get more use of them. But there's massive potential there, I would have said, for fraudulent de de declarations. And we have to be thinking about how we would overcome that, um, e if indeed we could. And again, it says to me you need some sort of uh, schedule of taxes that we're setting um, default levels based on, say, an average EU mix. Because the other thing is, you know, 
it's not a fixed proportion that people are going to use. Uh, you talk to plastics new processors today and they'll tell you that the demand has dropped off as the price for plastics has fallen and uh, many of the plastics uh, users are probably specifying more primary relative to secondary than they were when the price was high, when the primary price was high. And so you get those periodic variations driven by the commodity price. Um, so it all turns into levels based on verification. So what's the price? The price is reduced resource consumption. I'm not going to put numbers on this because I think it's, you know, it's scenarios. Enhanced commercial logic of circular economy approaches. Stimulates a system-wide change. Increased use of secondary, if we get that secondary primary differentiation right, relative to primary. And greater certainty in driving the change because the taxes themselves, remember, they're not positive. They're more or less fixed. And so we're not, we've got a, a, a fixed element of what we do. But think of how people talk about um, fuel prices today. And we, you know, we've got a, a significant proportion of that price of the duty. Look at what's happening to landfill today. The price, we've driven out all sort of super profits from um, running landfills today. And um, profits are, it, it's a competitive industry. The tax at 18 quid a tonne and the pre tax price for landfill has just stayed flat for the last 10 years or so. So, in summary, the premise of scarcity, high prices, and volatility can drive the circular economy. Founders, to some extent, on that same price quality. Um, that doesn't mean we shouldn't pursue it, far from it. I think it's a really uh, it's, a, it's something we should pursue, we should pursue actively, and I'm arguing for a, an active pursuit through, the, through, through trying to develop policy. We could have talked about loads of other policies, by the way, this is definitely not the only one, but I wanted to, to sort of test this today. Um, it's an opportunity, I think, to bring resource taxation out of the too difficult box. As I said, I don't think we can take it out of the too difficult box and say, do this tomorrow. That's unreasonable. It's not going to happen. But if we're serious about trying to generate this change, and I think we ought to be at least giving this a serious airing and trying to look at it positively uh, and try to strip out the, the shortcomings from it or deal with the shortcomings from it, um, and think positively about the mechanisms that we can do, the price could be very large indeed. I don't know what that price might be, but that's it. So um, thank you very much for listening. And, uh, well, thanks, Dominic. Do you just want to flip back a slide so we've got that up as an Ed memoir, so to speak? And um, yeah, let's have some questions. Uh, Matthew running up from the ISR as well. Um, what, what do you think would be the best foundation uh, for the tax in terms of ener the energy content? How, you know, how you yeah, I, I did think I was going to put up something about the interface with the ETS, but in theory you could say, you know, part of this is about, um, well, for me, what I would probably do is do something around carbon, the conventional air pollutants, and probably something around um, the sort of overburden on the primary. So, you know, the um, Ecological rucksack, if you like. Yeah. And, the, um, and exactly what you would do, you know, you've got, I know we, Paul, Paul, Paul and I would probably both agree that we don't want to make everything exactly externality driven, but I think in this case you would need a formula. And so you would need some base, so you'd have to choose your CO2 value. Of course, it wouldn't be the traded value, I think it would be something that looks more like a damage cost, you say, rather than a um, a value that comes out of the trading scheme. Uh, the EEA does a lot of work on the conventional air pollutants, and I think we can find an average level of, uh, for the EU. Uh, what you would use as your metric for the overburden, that's an interesting one. Um, but I think it's important to have that, because that's becoming more important, arguably, as we go into more fragile environments and so forth. But I think you need, you, you need uh, that's maybe not yeah. the, the best answer to the question. I, I could. Well, yeah, obviously different people will be more willing to accept different yeah, formulations of 
Yeah, and that, with, with the interaction with the ETS, you could, you could again, this comes back to computation, you could almost have something that deducted value <laughs> um, or, or, or for um, the price that had already been paid for them. And you could even do that for the stuff being imported as well, to the extent that you knew what was going on in other trading schemes. So you bought, your border tax adjustment would be adjusted to account for what had already been paid for in embodied carbon <coughs> Question again. You want to say who you are, and then we'll then. Yeah, sure. Uh, Jacob Hayler from the Environmental Services Association, uh, with a trade body that represents the waste and recycling industry. Um, just want to pick up your last point. That the price can be very large, indeed. Um, is that actually the case? Now, I'm thinking possibly around the implications for household recycling. Yeah. I'm thinking about with the composition of that sort of material. Quite a lot of it's low value. Yeah. Uh, a lot of garden waste, a lot of green waste, a lot of compost, um, a lot of paper, still currently. And yeah. if you price those, the carbon externalities <coughs> accurately for those, I don't think it would provide a very significant uh, level of price support for recycling those materials relative to the cost of the services that have to be put in place. And the implications looking at the household stream might actually be a more linear economy and less recycling. And at the same time, uh, in terms of landfill, you know, I haven't looked at it for a few years, but last time I looked at what the optimal landfill tax might be for a ton of mixed waste, it came out at about £40 a tonne, which is obviously about half the current levels. Mm. So is, are the implications of pricing the externalities accurately and actually less recycling from the landfill? Uh, my, I, I, I'm, I'm interested why, why you think it would be less. In, I think what would happen is that the, the, the way it would work is it would work on the demand side for the, for the second one too. I think there would be a stronger demand pull for that. And I actually think that from that point of view, you might end up with more being spent on those services and that would be the case. Um, the, uh, and um, bear in mind if you've got that differential, you know. It's interesting the way the primary and the secondary material markets interact. They don't, they move more or less together, but not exactly together. So if you're whacking up the price of the primary in terms of the, the primary externality of that third, then it doesn't necessarily mean you've increased the price of the secondary by that much, um, but by the amount of the externality on the secondary. You can, the, arguably, the primary and secondary are still going to compete more or less. So the sort of pre tax value of the secondary commodity would, would I think be higher by dint of the differential in the externalities, probably speaking, it depends on the shapes of demand for the more rest of it. And so I think you'd get more, I think you'd get more uh, a, a stronger stimulus for the for getting that second secondary to one. Of course, though you've given me the opportunity to say it's utter nuts to talk, even think about the circular economy when we still fail to charge households for throwing stuff away when we can. We should. And uh, it's complete nuts. And um, how can we have a talk about circular economy when it's free for people just to throw stuff away? At the margin. Yeah, I'm, I want to um, I want to pursue this a bit, uh, Dominic, but we may pursue it a bit afterwards as well, because that last bullet point, I think, uh, is the critical point of the argument, it seems to me. I'm interested in Jacob's perception of the external cost of landfill at 40 pounds a tonne. Uh, I remember David Pierce calculated that it was 7 pounds a tonne in 1996, which was the basis of the landfill tax when it was introduced. Well, we're nearly 20 years on from that, kind of a bit of inflation. I, I don't know whether they've gone up. They might have gone up because of uh, population densities and people getting more sensitive to these things, so willingness to pay would have increased. But I'm absolutely certain they're not 80 pounds a ton. Um, and, and that means that I, I, I'd like you to talk a bit more about what this prize might be, because it seems to me that it is almost impossible to justify the circular economy on the basis of <coughs> neoclassical economic arguments. Yeah. But there has to be a big slug of kind of moral commitment in there somewhere. Yeah. And, and the two bits of me that the moral commitment bit and the neoclassical economist bit 
fight it out the whole time. Yeah, when I, I, I have that fight as well. When I'm thinking about this prize here. And it, it seems to me that that sense of just treating the earth properly, mm -hmm. treating the earth properly does not mean putting millions of tons of gleek into ecosystems on a kind of continuing basis is probably part of the rationale for this stuff. And, and I just wonder if you could speculate to what extent you think in the discussions that you have, because you talk to lots of local authorities and all that stuff, how far are we in terms of actually rationalizing the circular economy that moves away from landfill, this zero waste concept, which is adopted in Scotland, it's an aspiration even in England, uh, in DEFRA, it makes no economic sense at all from a neoclassical liberal economics point of view. Zero pollution never does. Um, so just talk a little bit about how you would justify that statement about the price being very large indeed. Well, first of all, I think we, we consume too much. And in this scenario, everything would get a bit more expensive. Um, and and you, we consume too much, but if scarcity is not a problem, yeah. so it doesn't matter if there's plenty of stuff there, why shouldn't we consume lots of it? Why shouldn't we waste it if, if it's scarcity is not a problem? I mean, that's just the way. I didn't say scarcity wasn't a problem. Ah, I think okay. scarcity and the way the, 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 the premise that, that scarcity will always that that the, the, we, we're always what is, when, when does a commodity become scarce um, it's always to some extent scarce economics is the study of you know mm -hmm. um, so that it's it's this idea that the um, that scarcity is the driver here um, I think that when we're talking about not using materials, we're, we're the, part of our prize is what damages we avoid. Um, I'm, you know, it's the, it is the embodied CO2, it is the embodied other pollutants, it is the um, embodied, uh, well, it's also the, the disturbance to land and ecosystems that we see as well. And um, so then, and and this this I don't think the effect is confined to just that. I I you know let's let's flip this on its head. If, if that was if it was true that all we needed to do to generate a social economy was have a high price, then aren't we more likely to do it with this with this uh, policy than without it? In which case, to the extent you might say that there are companies who would choose to or not to do certain things. Um, at a certain price level. Other things being, they've got, you know, they've got more of a commercial uh, uh, rationale for doing those things with this policy in place than without it. Yeah. So okay, yeah. the gentleman there had a question, I think. Yeah, you. Yes, I did. Thanks very much for the talk. Uh, could you say a little bit could more? Can you say who you are? Oh, my name is Lawrence Daring. I'm a student at the College of Law. And um, I'd like to pick you up because I'm not familiar uh, with this debate, on what you mean by the damage cost or the externality cost. Um, because if it's not a price as in the ETS that's determined by supply and demand, what is it? Um, <laughs> um, it is uh, the this is a, this is, this, it's, it's basically trying to understand and put. Um, no, let me rephrase that because I hate it when people start sentences with it's basically. It's not basic at all. Um, the, uh, there are various techniques that economists use to try to uh, monetize particular <coughs> environmental effects um, uh, to <coughs> try to understand how we can value them in. in, in in terms of costs and benefits. So, for example, I'm not going to go into the climate change one because that would be horrendous, but you know, you're talking about what would be the potential impacts of sea level rise and what would be the potential impacts of um, uh, diseases moving around the globe and in the 
used in the suits and those blah blah blah. But the um, but for example with uh, conventional air balloons like Knox, you're talking about um, people looking at uh, trying to understand what incremental changes in the concentration of NOx have on um, particular health endpoints, and they will use a number of health endpoints that might some of them might be to do with respiratory complaints. Some of them might be acute, and some of them might be um, morbidity uh, issues. And um, uh, economists try to effectively put a value on each of those health endpoints and try to understand the contribution of the pollutant to those health endpoints. And you can make it a bit more complicated too by linking that um, the, the uh, mission of the pollutant to the exposure of the population. So how many, you know. Uh, you might have very different, um, in, in, if you were to do this in a sort of more micro way, you might have different damages for certain pollutants in very densely populated areas, for example, than in, in more rural ones. Um, so a lot of people argue about um, marine bunker fuels used to ship uh, stuff around the globe and say, oh, SO2 from those uh, those um, ships doesn't really matter because the pollution doesn't really affect people to down the middle of nowhere. Um, uh, some pollutants have a more local logic and some have a more regional one. So um, uh, we have an interesting debate in this country about whether we should take into account the damages caused by pollutants we emit here, particularly on the east side of the country, that they have on the continent. And the standard death review is that we don't. Whereas the European view is that we should. That's a problem. And so you end up with some sort of different ways of doing um, you know, it. We could talk more about different ways in which people try to value those things. Well, let's, let's think about that. It's now um, 22, which is around the time we normally finish. Um, what normally happens at these events, and if you've got one more question on tape at the end, is that when we finish the formal proceedings, we go upstairs, but we have uh, some refreshments and we can continue to chat on a bilateral basis and we'll be doing that in a minute. Um, so uh, that's a good thing. Uh, did, did, were you indicating you wanted to ask a question? <coughs> uh, we've got two more. I'll take them together. So Dominic, you can keep them in your head um, or just make a note of them and then we'll ask you to answer briefly. Yes. Yeah, the only one card in the renewable energy at all. Miles Allen has suggested quite strongly that primary carbon should be taxed at sources when it comes out of the ground. They should be taxed in that way. And as we get closer to the two degrees C budget, the tax should rise. So ultimately, when you got very close to the limiting emissions budget, the tax would be enormous. And that would be one way of dealing with the embedded carbon. As far as scarcity, scarcity is concerned, that really depends on the cost of the embedded energy. So the higher the cost of the energy is concerned, you're producing the whatever uh, from a new uh, resource you're producing, that will be defined by the amount of energy you can contained in it. And that's really what we're concerned about. As long as it's low carbon energy, you may not really be concerned with anything else. Well, that's an interesting point, which Dominic, I'm sure, will uh, pick up. The lady here, the last one. Yeah, Andrew Astor, um, different perhaps. Uh, the one word that didn't come up was the word equity. And what's quite interesting with resources is which resources and then what are the impact on the final sectors? Because any politician straight away go, oh, food. And then the impact on that, what that then means, would make it less likely that something like tax would be introduced. So I think the question is, it'd be really fascinating to look at, and it is a shame we didn't put what some of the other options would be, because obviously within different sectors, you could say, let's model this, well, what could the impacts be? Because you might be talking about how could a transition happen, what would be the other things, how would you balance a tax with something that then makes it more cost effective to actually make that shift to happen. So I think it's just like asking the bigger question about the different end products and their impact on, on people and the economy. Yeah, that's a really interesting point because um, uh, the, um, the uh, in another, but first of all, an equity, um, 
it's uh, always interesting that we tend to look at commodities very much from the point of view of our own uh, situation in this country. And of course, there's other countries who are heavily dependent on primary commodities for their income. Um, um, you know, so um, here's the portion of total merchandise exports by value on the left-hand side, and these are low-income countries, so there's middle-income countries and high-income countries. So I, I used this as part of a presentation at the end, which I, I, I was asking people, well, do you think it's a good idea to put a commodity price at a higher or value? Or and you know, because um, there's flips, there's, there's lots of different ways of looking at it. So there's the country differences. And when you see the some of the graphics on commodity price indices, a lot of those, what they're doing is they're taking commodity prices and they're deflating those prices, not by some consumer price index, but they're taking an index of the value of manufacturers. And so what that means is it's not really a commodity price index per se, it's more a terms of trade index for a commodity price exporter relative to manufacturers. And so these, it's, it's like what's the terms of trade looking like for these people? And it's looking, you know, arguably pretty tough over until recently. Um, in terms of within the countries, then um, we could go in and I think have a quite an interesting debate about how you would address the equity potential with the revenue. I deliberately didn't put the revenue up at the end, but clearly if, we, if you did implement tax on top of that, you would generate a lot of revenue. Um, you would, by and large, not have to uh, apportion off, um, you would definitely not need 100% of it to compensate the, the poorest people in society. So you would still be able, as it were, to uh, to have a considerable proportion of the effect, and yet um, uh, address some of the equity concerns with, with the revenue that is generated. Of course, there's a question about exactly how you use that revenue, and um, I prefer it wasn't in a way that dampened the effect of the instrument, and so you were, you know, you're doing it through social uh, some instrument of social policy. On the um, First, you, you made an interesting point about this sort of tax getting higher the closer you get to a, a sort of some sort of threshold. Uh, that's an interesting concept, but the, um, it almost says we're going to risk ourselves getting to that threshold. If you were to build in the fact that you didn't want to get there in the first place, you know, arguably you'd go higher quicker to prevent you getting to the threshold. And um, as always, one of the interesting things when the government had its old uh, social cost of carbon and um, had the, the social cost of carbon rising and rising and rising over time in real terms, you sort of thought, well, isn't that sort of planning to some extent for failure? Um, of course, you, know, you could say, well, yeah, the UK doesn't have control of the thing, but of course, well, it's really not like that. But on the, on the embodied carbon from in the material side, you're right. And I think we would, you know, we, 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 this, if you were to have, going back to the point about um, how would you formulate your, the, the level of the tax, and I said you would have an embodied CO2 content, you wouldn't be horribly disappointed if the, uh, the, the material started to be produced using the new energy. Um, you'd probably, probably be quite uh, comfortable about that um, to, to a degree. Um, that raises questions in terms of how that type of tax would develop over time. Because I think then you would tend, it's a little like uh, the energy tax directive that was recently sidelined, was going to have a CO2 component and an energy content component. And the more you address the CO2 element, arguably the more you start to shift onto the energy component itself to try and get people to be more efficient with their use of energy recognising that you might have dealt largely with the carbon side. And the same I would say here, you could um, you know, change the nature of your metrics, not radically over time, but uh, to try to take into account the fact that you were looking for people to get more efficient with using more materials, whether they were primary or so. And so you'd start to, you know, it's almost as though you're shifting the tax base to some extent over time to be the material full stop irrespective of what, you know, almost irrespective of this carbon.
why would you want to turn a second into I'd like you to pursue this upstairs, please. If you're coming upstairs, I've heard the clock going, and we've only got a certain amount of time. So thank you very much indeed.